Welcome. My name is uh, Eline van der Beek, and I'm going to talk to you today about nutritional needs during the first thousand days to support growth and development during infancy and toddlerhood and pay attention to the influence of maternal health. I have uh, an affiliation to the Groningen University, but besides that, I'm uh, an employee of Nestle Research, and that's my disclosure for this presentation. When we talk about the first thousand days, there's now increasing awareness that how you grow and develop during the first thousand days actually contributes to your risk of non-communicable diseases later in life. We talk about diseases like obesity, but also diabetes and other metabolic diseases. And we know that once you're close to developing such a disease later in life, that any intervention that you can do at that time actually has a relatively small impact. So it's very difficult to prevent obesity or to prevent diabetes when you're already at a, at a pre-disease stage. We now start to understand that what you do during the first thousand days, although the impact may be relatively small, if you look at it from a life course perspective, the contribution to the prevention of the development of non-communicable diseases later in life may actually be huge. So the first thousand days is roughly the moment of conception until the age of two years of the child. But the role of nutrition and the role of maternal health actually already starts before the moment of conception. The health of the mother and her diet really impact um, the moment, the starting point at conception, but also influence the nutrient flow between the mother and the fetus during pregnancy and therefore determine how the fetus grows during pregnancy. Also, after birth, maternal health and nutrition status remains important, especially during the period of breastfeeding, as her health and nutrition status can also translate into the composition of breast milk. Obviously, the moment that weaning foods start to come into the diet, also the quality of weaning foods is really important. During this period, really nutrient needs are incredibly high, but are completely different from what older children and adults need. And it's really crucial that the type of weaning foods that children are exposed to, that they're nutrient dense and meet the nutrient demands during this fast growth and, de and development period. But as said, it really starts with the health and nutrition status of the mother. We now know that both maternal overnutrition, but also maternal undernutrition are associated with adverse outcomes for the ch children, but also for the next generation. I think for a couple of decades, there's been a strong attention to maternal undernutrition because it's quite prevalent around the globe. Even today, maternal undernutrition and to target reducing maternal undernutrition remains a very important um, strategic development goal. But over time, when children, uh, when the nutritional environment started to change, we also need to realize that more and more we are dealing now with women that are actually overnourished and are over, uh, um, are actually uh, not undernourished anymore. The problem with women that are overnourished is that they may develop a, a higher BMI. And this really changes the nutrient exposure to the fetus already starting in the womb. It also increases the risk of pregnancy complications like gestational diabetes. And I will come back to that in a minute. In the end, both maternal undernutrition and maternal overnutrition have a tendency to drive processes where there's an excess adipose tissue development. And in the end, adipose tissue in the body is the starting point uh, for development of risk factors to develop obesity and also diabetes when children grow and develop. That really moving through a nutritional transition in the world can be a, uh, an important contributor to the increase in maternal overnutrition is uh, exemplified by what happened in Chile. In the 60s and the 70s of the previous century, there was a very high prevalence rate of undernutrition among women that were pregnant and lactating and also in young children. 
Uh, what actually happens in Chile is quite a rapid nutrition uh, transition period, where across a period of approximately 20 years, there was a national complementary food program that primarily addressed maternal uh, undernutrition during pregnancy and lactation, but also in children below the risk of uh, be below the, the age of six years. And since the 1990s, this has actually led to an increase in overweight and obesity rates that were higher in the low, lower socioeconomic strata that were the main target of this national complementary food program. All of this has now also led to a dramatic increase in non-communicable disease uh, rates in Chile. And therefore, targeting maternal undernutrition should be done with caution. And we should be able to give them the right nutrients. So let's take a closer look at what we actually now know about the relationship between the diet and uh, maternal obesity, but also the risk of developing obesity in the mo mother as well as in the offspring. So we know that mater maternal overweight and obesity in pregnant women is becoming more common across the globe. And this diagram actually shows you uh, the prevalence of, uh, or actually the number of women with overweight and obesity around the globe. And what is interesting about this graph is that although prevalence in some countries across the globe may actually still be relatively low, and there might be a dominance of maternal undernutrition, if you look at the absolute contribution in terms of the number of women with overweight and obesity, you can really see that the number is increasing and is actually quite high also in Asia, although that might not be top of mind if you think about maternal overweight and maternal obesity. So one of the reasons that this is really a serious problem across the globe is that we now know that maternal overweight and obesity is also associated with uh, pregnancy complications like uh, gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes is the development of diabetes specifically during pregnancy related to the fact that pregnancy comes with different insulin demands and the development of insulin resistance. Overweight comes already with early uh, insulin insensitivity and therefore poses a higher risk to develop gestational diabetes over the course of pregnancy. This gestational diabetes, but actually any deviation in glucose insulin metabolism comes with the risk of faster growth during pregnancy of the fetus. And what we've learned, for instance, from the HAPO study, uh, the hyperglycemia in pre and pregnancy outcome study that was conducted in a number of countries uh, across the globe, is that a higher um, levels of glucose, no matter how these levels of glucose were measured, during pregnancy are associated with a higher birth weight. And then especially the risk of a birth weight uh, above the 90th percentile was really showed a linear relationship with maternal glucose control. This higher um, birth weight also drove a higher risk of primary cesarean section. So uh, cesarean section as a result of a big baby and the, and the inability for the baby to be born via natural way. So we know about this linear relationship and it's really driven a discussion across the globe uh, to be more conscious of the development of gestational diabetes and to also monitor for it. But we also need to realize that in some countries across the globe, actually the prevalence of GDM is not yet high. So for instance, if I take my, my own uh, home country, the Netherlands, we know that the prevalence of GDM in the Netherlands is only two to 7%. However, if we look in women that have risk factors for the development of GDM, in which overweight and obesity is the most important, we see that in women with more than one risk factor, the prevalence of GDM is actually around 23% in the Netherlands. So it is high if you look at the right population of pregnant women. What we also know is that... Um, there is a, a treatment, of course, of GDM once it's diagnosed with the aim to try and reduce 
uh, high, the risk of high birth weight, but we also know that LGA, so being large at birth for children, uh, is actually almost 20% in the Netherlands, especially in this group of women that develop GDM, which shows that the current treatment of GDM and the current treatment of women uh, with overweight and obesity that become pregnant uh, may not be uh, adequate. So the risk of GDM is driven by obesity. What we need to understand that there's also a clear link with the diet. And I wanted to share some results that are coming from studies in which I was, was involved. On the left hand of the slide, you see citations of two studies where we looked at um, the associations between specific aspects of the diet of pregnant women and GDM outcomes. And uh, on the left side, it's a cohort that has been run in uh, Serembang, in uh, uh, Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, in which we could show that higher animal protein intake, especially during the second trimester of pregnancy, was associated with the risk of TDM. And this was particularly true not only for total protein intakes, but also for protein intake coming from animal sources uh, like red meat. Interestingly, for women that had a high protein intake, but then based on egg, protein, uh, egg uh, in their diet, that was actually associated with a lower risk of GDM. It's not only protein, but also, for instance, the intake of uh, sweetened beverages that had a correlation with the risk to develop uh, GDM. And this was particularly true for beverage intake before and during the first trimester of pregnancy, so very early in pregnancy. And we need to realize that in some populations, the intake of total energy coming from beverages, and then especially from sweetened beverages, may be quite high. So that is what we showed in Malaysia. But interestingly enough, I was also associated uh, with a study that ran in the north of the Netherlands in Groningen, where we showed that in a population of women that had a healthy BMI, we could still find associations between the diet and birth weight. In this case, we looked at the diet of women before they became pregnant, and we showed that during this period before pregnancy, total as well as protein intake from animal sources, but then in particularly from milk-based drinks uh, that were artificially sweetened, was associated with higher birth weights among women with a healthy BMI. It was more evident in women with lower BMIs compared to higher BMIs. And in this cohort, we did not find any associations with other sources of protein intake, um, although we did observe a U-shaped relationship between the intake of plant protein and lower both weight, uh, birth weight, both for high intakes of uh, vegetable proteins as well as for low intakes of vegetable proteins. So it's clear that besides this um, uh, health uh, aspects um, in the mother, also her diet contributes to how the fetus is fed and how the fetus grows. And this is then evident, for instance, by looking at not only a risk to develop a pregnancy complication like GDM, but also on an association with birth weight. So why is this important? So we know that children that are born with either a very low birth weight or with a very high birth weight have a higher risk of showing unbalanced growth. Balanced growth is actually the balance between the investment in early life in weight and length. That is important because we know growth is fast in early life. But it also comes with an investment in both lean body mass and adipose tissue mass. And especially the investment in adipose tissue mass is really high during the last trimester of pregnancy, as well as during the first year of life. If children grow very fast and, so, and, and show a form of catch-up growth because they're born with a low birth weight, there's a higher risk of additional adipose tissue development. But the same is true for the other end of the spectrum. So if children are born with a high birth weight, they have a higher risk of growing fast and therefore also depositing more adipose tissue during this early period of, uh, of growth. And that actually sets you up for a different body composition. And a more balanced growth will actually manage the balance between lean and adipose tissue mass deposition in early life and therefore lower the risk of development of obesity in later life. 
So in, in, in uh, systematic analysis and, and meta-analysis, it's now been clearly shown that being born with a high birth weight, in this case, on the left-hand side, babies born with a, uh, with a birth weight of more than four uh, kilos were two times more likely to be overweight as children. And once you're overweight as a child, you also have a higher risk to become, become overweight or obese as an adult. But the um, individual uh, analysis of almost 10,000 children coming from different studies on the right-hand side shows that also children that grow fast after birth, regardless of the birth weight, have a higher risk of developing childhood obesity and an increase in an SD score between birth and one year uh, of age of just one SD score was associated with a two time higher risk of childhood obesity in this meta analysis. So fast growth after birth is not healthy. And what we've learned over the years that actually the mode of feeding during infancy is associated with growth after birth. We know that breastfeeding is associated with a lower weight and length trajectory in the period of birth up to 12 months. And that also indicates that this fast growth in early life may especially be detrimental. So a good question to ask, of course, is what is that contributes in breast milk that could be associated with this pattern of lower weight and length development over time that reduces the risk of obesity in later life. So one of the factors in breast milk that has received a lot of attention is the amount of protein present in breast milk. Driven by the quality of um, protein sources available to construct uh, best breast milk substitutes for a very long time, the concentration of proteins present in infant formulas has been much higher than the levels present in human milk. What you can clearly see from this detailed analysis in this graph is that although initially in breast milk, the amount of protein may be quite high, and this is especially true for the first days of, uh, of um, breastfeeding uh, when the colostrum is there, it's really clear that over time, the amount of protein in breast milk decreases, whereas the amount of uh, protein in infant formulas and also in follow-up formulas, uh, especially uh, in, in the past, has been much higher, mostly driven by the differences in protein quality. It's clear that the protein that comes either from the breast milk or from infant formulas has to be of sufficient quality to deliver the essential amino acids that can only come by the, from the diet and that cannot be produced in the body itself which has driven this in the past. So obviously, this is a topic that has received a lot of attention in the past uh, to see if that was one of the factors that would indeed contribute to the risk of higher, uh, higher risk of overweight development and obesity in children. The CHOP study that has been conducted in Europe has actually investigated that. In that study, both... Um, Two interventions were compared. One intervention uh, focusing on the presence of low amounts of protein in formula and then compared it with high amounts of protein and the amounts that were present both during the, uh, the early phase of infancy as well as later uh, uh, during the, the second half of the first year were driven by the regulatory environment depicting the low and the upper end of the amount of protein that was regulatory approved to be present in infant milk formula. What was clearly shown is that indeed high protein intake, especially uh, in the period after four months, was associated with a higher BMI development over time, whereas the children were exposed to formula containing lower amounts of protein, uh, were, uh, showed a growth uh, development pattern that was closely uh, closer to the breastfeeding reference group. But what is also clear from later analysis, when they started to look at the follow-up of these children at six months of age, that the children that had a high risk to develop a higher BMI that was associated with overweight and obesity development in these children later were mostly the children that grew fast, that actually also already had a higher birth weight 
to start with. And it's these children that clearly show that if they're exposed after having been born with a higher birth weight and showing a very fast growth during the first year of life, indeed have this higher BMI development uh, over time uh, with the children ending up with a much higher BMI at the age of six years. If you look at the BMI development of the children that were growing around the 50th centile, it's really clear that although the children with the high protein end up with a slightly higher BMI, the differences are much smaller compared to the children that grow fast. So it is really also important to look not only at this early protein exposure, but really look at nutrient intake uh, over time. Like I said earlier, um, nutrient needs are really high during this period of fast growth and development. And what other studies have showed after is that total protein intake, but also the quality of protein is clearly associated with child obesity risk. If we look at the period uh, of six months until 24 months, which actually puts more emphasis on the quality of the uh, weaning diet because milk starts to play a smaller role over time after the initial period of complete breast milk feeding. A recent systematic review of prospective studies now clearly shows that there's a link between total protein intake, but in particular protein of animal origin, like cow's milk being a source of very high levels of protein between birth and two years of age was associated with a higher BMI. And this confirms actually very early data that were published at the end of the previous century from the Donald study. What is clearly shown is that this high protein intake uh, is associated with a higher body fat development, but also an earlier adiposity rebound, which, which actually uh, correlates to a higher BMI trajectory. And these are results from the ELAND study that, is depict, that are depicted on the right-hand side. So it is true that it's not only the early protein, but it's really the protein intake during this complete period of fast growth and development, not only during infancy, but also during toddlerhood, that is likely to contribute. In the ELAND study, they've actually uh, went on and did some more analysis. And what was really interesting is that they showed that it's not this only higher protein intake during this period of birth until two years of age, but maybe even beyond during the complete uh, childhood period. But maybe it's also other differences in macronutrient intake that may contribute to the higher risk of overweight and obesity. On the right-hand side of this graph, you see depicted the recommended intakes from both from carbohydrates as well as from fat as well as from protein. What you can clearly see is that the recommended intakes are based on the initial low protein contribution coming from human milk and then understanding that protein needs increase uh, during growth and development also related to the different developmental steps that happen during um, infancy and then toddlerhood and also childhood. While protein intake, protein recommendations initially may be quite low, fat intakes are actually um, supposed to be quite high. Again, also driven by what we know about the contribution of fat intake in terms of total energy coming from breast milk. So while it's initially supposed to be about 40%, it should decrease over time. If we then look at the reality after the re uh, analysis of the ELANS data on the left-hand side, you can see that not only protein intakes were relatively high, but clearly fat intakes do not uh, match the recommended intakes for total fat intake in terms of total energy. They were too low in the early infancy periods and they contribute actually more uh, to the total diet than they're supposed to do based on the recommendations. And it's now this combination of high protein intake and low fat intake that we think might be a driver for the accelerated growth that could be related to the increased risk of childhood obesity. So all of this has led to a hypothesis for which there's now also a clear idea on what could be the underlying mechanisms that could drive this. So it's really this unbalance in nutrition across the first thousand days and beyond 
during childhood and even during adolescence that may uh, help to explain the higher risk of obesity and non-communicable diseases. So high protein intake, for instance, could drive very high IGF, and this could lead, this could contribute to the accelerated growth and also the early adiposity rebound, including the higher adiposity deposits that you could see in early life. But the fat restriction could drive a lower leptin contribution as an internal mechanism. And the idea is now that the long-term effects of these lower leptin drive may lead to a situation of leptin resistance at the level of the hypothalamus. And this could then be in turn associated with the higher circulating leptin and the reduced leptin sensitivity uh, associated with the higher body fat stores that is associated with the risk of adult overweight and obesity. And therefore, in adulthood, uh, you're actually not adequately um, equipped to be able to respond to a leptin challenge. So it's good to understand that if we think about the, um, uh, the risk of uh, overweight and development over time, that we really can think about these successive uh, steps in our nutritional journey that all have their contribution. Um, so we can think about the high protein intakes, but we should not only think about high protein, but also about the low fat intake and the quality of the protein and the fat that's present in our diet. This continues during childhood and adolescence, where also the high fat intake may become a separate contributor, uh, in, in addition to literature that now shows that also high sugar intake may contribute uh, to the journey towards uh, overweight and obesity risk. As I started at the beginning of my presentation, we should not underestimate the starting point. And we now start to understand that especially the contribution of maternal pre-pregnancy BMI that also is associated with a higher risk of having an unbalanced glycemic control during pregnancy may be a major contributor to how the child grows and develops and therefore become a risk together with these nutritional factors in the during the postnatal phase. So taking all of this together, for me, it's really clear that we talk about a multifactorial problem and that we require a multi-target solution. It already starts recognizing the drivers that come with the health and nutrition status of the mother. But actually, we should start to recognize all of the opportunities that are there during the first thousand days to improve the nutritional journey uh, and, and prevent the risk of developing overweight and obesity during childhood and adulthood. Thank you very much for your attention.